Well, what do I have here? I have a beautiful example of projectile motion. And what's projectile motion? Well, motion in two dimensions, where we have a horizontal motion, in this case, moving at a constant velocity, and vertical motion, where we have a constant acceleration. In this case, due to the gravitational field. And how do I know it's projectile motion? Because the shape I'm drawing out here is a beautiful parabola. But what if I told you this is not a parabola? In fact, most examples of projectile motion that you're familiar with, whether that be at school or in the playground throwing a ball around, it's not a parabola. If your teacher told you that it's a parabola, well, that's not entirely true. So before we start, let's see if we can actually mathematically model projectile motion as a parabola. And the way we do that is simply by looking at our equations of motion, both to the vertical and the horizontal. Let's just look at the time of flight in the upward portion only. So in other words, to the top of the trajectory. So our final velocity is going to be zero at the top. Our initial velocity is going to be equal to u, but we're going to say y because we're only interested in the initial vertical velocity. The acceleration is going to be g. Our displacement is going to be y and our time of t. In the horizontal component, constant velocity, so is ux. Our displacement is going to be an x and then it's t. Now what we just need our equations. Now if I substitute everything in, now what about the horizontal? x is equal to vt. Now, is that this time and this time is exactly the same. So if I rearrange that, what I can do is that t ends up being equal to x over ux. And now I'm going to substitute that into my other equation. Now, if you see carefully, I have a constant here and a constant here. So if I simplify this by using just simply a letter for the constant, what I end up is getting y is equal to some constant. I'm going to call it b, you'll see y, x plus a x squared. And I have a x squared plus b x minus y is equal to zero. So there's my quadratic formula, which gives us a parabola where x is the displacement in the horizontal direction and y is the displacement in the vertical direction. We have our parabola. Now I'm going to show you a demonstration to show us the first thing we need to consider when we're analyzing projectile motion situations. Can you see what I'm trying to demonstrate? So obviously what I'm dealing with here is the concept of air drag or air resistance. Have you ever noticed that when you do a question involving projectile motion, it'll say ignoring air resistance. But you can't ignore air resistance unless you are on the moon or a planet without any atmosphere, air drag will always be a feature and will stop your projectile undergoing a parabolic type of motion. But air drag is complex. It's not just a constant force that opposes the direction of motion. Let's have a closer analysis of drag. Before we start, let's quickly draw a representation of our normal projectile motion where we have a parabola. And in this case, the only force acting is the force in the downward direction, that is due to gravity. But what are the possible paths that you might see if drag or air resistance actually plays a part? Well, there are some options. Now, as you can see, the possible paths that my object can take may vary depending on a whole bunch of variables, which I'll discuss in a moment. But I want to make the point here is that what you see here is not parabolas. In other words, there is no symmetry going on here and we don't have parabolic motion because we have now the concept of air resistance or air drag. And the key thing here is that this force that is applied due to air resistance is not even even just in one direction. It's opposing the motion. So for example, that direction of the force is heading in that direction. And over here, of course, it's heading in that direction. And over here, it's heading in that direction. So the force direction changes. But as you can see, these possible paths suggests that there are variables in play that we need to look at. Well, we can look at that by what is known as the drag equation. And the drag equation says simply this, that the force of drag 
that an object might experience is equal to one half multiplied by rho, multiplied by a, multiplied by cd, and multiplied by v squared. Let me explain each of these things and show how they contribute to air drag. Well, the first is rho. Rho is the density of the material it's moving through. So in our case, it's air. But obviously, if the air density changes, such as due to temperature, then that's going to affect the drag. And obviously, an object moving through water, then they're going to have increased drag as a result. What's A? Well, A is the cross-sectional area. So take my pen, for example. If I move, throw it in your direction, in this direction, that's my cross-sectional area that is smaller than the cross-sectional area this way. So in other words, there's less drag this way and greater drag this way. And then we have V squared. Well, the faster the object is moving, the more drag it experiences, and it's a square relationship. And so therefore you would experience a lot more drag in the early parts of the flight and less drag once we get to over here. In fact, once why it drops off here, of course, is that the drag now has stopped because it's no longer moving greatly in the forward direction. And then and of course, it's just going to drop straight down because now all we have is the force due to gravity. Now, you can see I've left something off, and that is this CD. And this CD is our coefficient of drag, and it's a bit of a fudge factor. And what do I mean by that? Well, what else about this pen will affect its drag? Well, its shape and its texture, that makes it much, much more complex. In other words, if I throw it this direction, obviously these shapes here are going to affect how much drag it experiences. And it's not something that you can calculate out mathematically. You have to do it by experimentation. In other words, empirical data. And therefore, you have this fudge factor that allows you to have a value for an object based on, well, its texture. So we have this surface or friction drag and also its shape, for example. And then of course, with wings, we have the idea, well, a wing can have a certain shape, but of course, as soon as it has an angle of attack, it will have lift. And so therefore, that's going to also affect the idea of drag. This is this thing called the coefficient of drag, which is simply a mathematical number that allows us to adjust for complexities of objects. So let's say we have a perfectly square box. Its coefficient of drag may be around 2.1, whereas a sphere will have a value of around 0.5. What about something more complex? What about a skydiver? A skydiver can have a coefficient of drag anywhere between 1 and 1.4. Consider of the way that they might fall through the air, whether they are uh, sort of spread eagled out or whether they're actually pointing down, that obviously can affect how much drag they experience. What about that wing from a plane? Well, in normal operation, that value is actually quite small, 0 0.05. So the drag is a lot less. The last thing, of course, is that we also need to have a look at acceleration. And of course, all I need to do there is divide by my mass. So in my little demonstration, I threw a rubber ball and I threw a wad of paper. And clearly, not only was the dimensions different, was but also the mass was different and all contributed to how they moved through the air. Now, let me explain another reason why projectile motion is not truly parabolic. We take the assumption that our Earth is flat, but that's not true. The shape is, of course, a curve. We're standing on a curved surface. Now, you and I will not notice this curvature in a small scale, but in reality, it is curved. Now, that in of itself is not going to be a big issue. In fact, if I were to be standing on top of a hill, like a curved surface like this, as a result, we would still get a parabolic path, all things being equal. But that's not really the issue. The issue is this. What these arrows represent are the gravitational field lines. In other words, they represent the gravitational field around our Earth. Now, the spacing between these lines tells us the strength. And so therefore, as you can see, the spacing increases. And so what we are saying here is, is that the gravitational field strength gets weaker the further away we are from Earth. In other words, the acceleration due to gravity is less as we move away. Well, in projectile motion, what are we saying? We're saying that the acceleration needs to be constant, but that's not the case. In reality, it gets weaker. Now, for all intents and purposes, if I throw a ball up two meters, then the value is roughly still 9.8 meters per second squared. But in reality, though, it is actually weaker. And we could measure that if we have the correct, precise instruments. Now, if this is therefore not going to generate our parabola, 
what is the shape that our projectile will have if it's launched within a changing gravitational field. So let's explore the whole idea of the gravitational field. As I said to you earlier, is that if we have a flat surface, we have our gravitational field lines, which are going to be directly down. And as a result, we have an acceleration that is constant in the vertical direction, and of course, constant velocity in the horizontal direction. But as I said to you before, the Earth's surface is curved, and I am accentuating, of course, the curvature. Now, what does that mean in terms of our projectile? Our projectile of course is launched and it appears as a lovely parabola but the problem is is that my gravitational field lines are not always pointing in the same direction they are changing because they're all pointing towards the center of mass which is let's say roughly and this point over here and so we might have a force going in that direction and of the same on the other side same size same strength because the same distance from the center of mass up here and I'm of course accentuating it this here, it's pointing obviously in the downward direction, but the value will be weaker. It'll be a weaker force. And of course, in every other subsequent positions, there will be similarly different sizes of vectors and different directions. As a result, this does not allow for the development of a parabola. But what shape is it? Well, in essence, this was worked out by Johannes Kepler in the 16th century, is that basically any objects in orbit will travel in an elliptical path such that, that it goes around what we call two foci, one of them being the center of mass of the object that it's revolving around. So that is our center of mass over here. And then of course, for an ellipse, we need another foci, and I'm going to just arbitrary put it over here. What that means is that this path here will be, and I'll do it as best as I can, it will be an ellipse. And you can see here my elliptical drawing is not precise. The object will stay in an elliptical orbit as long as nothing gets in the way. Well, unfortunately, the Earth gets in the way, and so therefore our parabola, in essence, is actually a section of an ellipse. Now you say, hold on, don't objects travel in a circular orbit? Well, a circle is actually an ellipse, a special ellipse, such that these two points are exactly the same position. The semi-major axis and the semi-minor axis are the same size. In other words, it's the radius. Now this sort of, again, suggests that if I somehow were to create a precise channel through the Earth, then my objects would stay in that path and return back to the top position. Again, this is a simplification. It's not the complete picture. Why? Well, as the object travels through the Earth, obviously the center of mass is not there. It's basically experiencing forces of localized masses, the mantle, the crust, and so forth, in the various positions as it goes around. And so therefore, even then, this is not the complete picture. So what I'm trying to say here is, is that the assumptions of the gravitational field strength is constant is not true. For all intents and purposes, it's approximately true, but in reality, it isn't. So in summary, we have examined two key aspects that stop a projectile motion from being truly parabolic. The first being air drag, and the second being the fact that the gravitational acceleration changes as we go further away from the Earth, and therefore the path becomes more elliptical rather than actually a parabola. Now, am I actually saying that teachers are wrong in teaching projectile motion with the parabola in mind? Well, obviously, no. Being a teacher myself, I also teach the concept of projectile motion in terms of parabolic motion, where we ignore air resistance. Now, why is that? I do that because I need to be able to teach to a level that students can understand. And so by introducing all the complexities of projectile motion, air drag, gravitational change, and so forth, it, they actually may not fully appreciate and understand the concepts without first looking at it from a more simplistic model. And that's the key point. All of the formulas we deal with with projectile motion and all the ones on my shirt are all mathematical models. They are representations to help us understand our universe, but they are not necessarily the truth of the matter. Nature is far more complex than any mathematical model that we or scientists might develop. And so that's the important thing, is that when you teach and learn 
concepts in physics and in science and in general, we deal with models. We need to understand that they are simplified to help our understand the universe we live in. My name is Paul from Physics High. Please like, share and subscribe. Please consider supporting me via Buy Me A Coffee. There is a link in the description below. Thanks for watching. Take care and bye for now.